The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Let only your words flow from, from my mouth, O Lord, and may our ears be filled with only your words. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for giving me the privilege, the honor, and the sheer pleasure of addressing you this morning. In the past 30 years of my life, I have worshipped in many different houses of worship in many different denominations, and I have never seen such raw passion, such raw faith and love as I have seen in this worship house this morning. For someone who is not one for showing public displays of emotion, I have had a tear in the corner of my eye since the worship began. And the love that I feel for each of you, though I haven't seen you before this morning, is so full and my heart is so full to overflowing. <laughs> when many people think of the liturgical season that is Lent, they often think of the chocolate or coffee they're about to go without. Repentance, ashes and sackcloth, a rather dreary image indeed. And there is some truth to that image. Not only is Lent the season leading up to Palm Sunday that will eventually turn to Good Friday, the crucifixion of our Savior, but it also represents the 40 days that Christ spent fasting in the desert which climaxes with the devil tempting him and testing him in ways that many of us succumb to. When we give up something we love, like favorite foods or activities, or taking on something extra, like an extra hour spent in prayer and study or in service, we are setting ourselves to the side and accepting a change in our priorities. We are opening ourselves to a little introspection where we take personal inventory of our walk with God. This can be a difficult and even somber time of year, which is what Satan waits for. He wants to remind us of each and every one of our sins and failures. He wants our despair and self-loathing because he knows that few things will cause a separation from our Father in Heaven faster than the feeling and unworthiness that comes with the acknowledgement of our shortcomings. That said, Lent shouldn't be the bummer of the liturgical calendar. It should be a time of renewal, a time for taking the burden that is our sins and laying them at the foot of the cross. It should be a time of rest. That being said, when I say rest, I'm not referring to the naps we take after a very good meal or a good night's sleep. I mean the rest that only comes in releasing our burdens and trusting in God's forgiveness because of the blood shed by Jesus Christ, his only begotten. The rest that only God can grant us. Rest allows one's mind, body, and soul to renew and start with even more strength and focus. In the 11th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, our Lord gave one of his most quoted invitations. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen. This is an extraordinary invitation. 
We are being asked to lay down everything that is considered a burden, our worries, our woes, our carnal cravings, and most of all, ourselves. In his series of talks that we know as Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis speaks on the invitation found in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, and what he refers to as the Christian way. The Christian way is different, Lewis declared, harder and easier. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and there. I want the whole tree down. I don't want to drill the tooth or crown it or stop it, but to have it out. Hand over the whole natural self, all desires which you think innocent as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. Whoa. So what Lewis is pointing out is that in order to lay down those heavy burdens, we have to get over ourselves and our natural selfish inclinations in order to pick up the light burden-free cross that Christ carries. There's an invitation, reaction, and reward system taking place here. We have to acknowledge that we carry a lot of unnecessary baggage. We have to repent of the willful priorities that distracts us in our walk with God and become stumbling blocks that we continually trip over. I don't know about you, but this seems to me the whole point of Lent right here. We have to deal with the, uh, the issues God is wrestling with us over in order to achieve that holy state of rest that Jesus is promising us in this amazing situation. The first step is to listen to what the invitation is. The second step is to make the decision to trust that the sacrifice of self that is required is for nothing but our own good. And then to let go of what holds us back. The third step is to rest in the perfect grace that is being offered and continue to walk in the promise given. Rest is important to one's spiritual walk with God, and many Christians don't appreciate the value of rest or keeping the Sabbath day holy. We live in a world today where a good day or a bad day is determined by the amount of work that gets done, the amount of money that is made, and if any time is deemed wasteful, it puts a wrench in the whole situation. And I'm sure you're well aware of this fact, brothers and sisters in Christ, but we are far from being immune to worldly standards for time used. Many of us worry when we take a nap or watch a movie when we could be out serving the homeless. Or instead of going to church and spending time with family, we hole up to play video games or go shopping. We still do these activities, and please hear me when I say they aren't bad activities to participate in. Far from it. But there is a fine difference between self-care and self-absorption. When it becomes a constant habit, it becomes a distraction, and then we lose sight of far more important activities. When our biggest priority continues to be ourselves after we find ourselves in a state of well-being, that good thing is no longer good. Now, I preach this not because I have it figured out, but because I don't. By an amen, how many of you are in this boat with me? First of all, thank you, Lord, I'm not the only one. (laughs) 
If there are any of you who do have it figured out, please do see me after the service and tell me your secret, because I would love to hear it. Now, you seem like a loving and Christ-like group of followers. May I level with you for a moment? Would that be all right? When Pastor McNeil texted me early this past Wednesday morning and informed me of my topic, I was scared spitless. I looked heavenward where I swore I could hear God guffawing at my predicament. I was being asked to preach on not just one of my spiritual failings, but two. There was no way I could preach about resting in God and trusting his plan for us without feeling like a major hypocrite, at least not without confessing to that weakness. In order to rest in God's grace, we have to trust in him. And for me, that can be an extremely tall order. A couple of months ago, I went to a church where a dear friend of mine is the rector. She's also the wife of the chaplain I work with. In her sermon, she spoke of how she struggled with trust when it comes to airplanes and the people she has to trust from the pilots to the engineers. Her sermon both convicted and put today's sermon in perspective as I spent the, four, the past four days preparing. For those of you who have never pre prepared or preached a sermon, there is a lot of trust involved. I have to trust that the theology and ministry professors at Northwest Christian University have helped me cultivate the skills required to study scripture and the theologians correctly. I have to trust that the sources I used also interpreted those texts correctly. I have to trust that the McNeils have enough confidence in me to entrust you to my teachings and that they have my back. I have to trust that you will be gracious enough to wait until after the final amen to take me out behind the rectory and decorate my alb with ripened tomatoes if I foul this up. Harder still, I have to trust that I have the words that I'm uttering and that they're the ones that God wants me to speak to his glory and not just my desire to be clever and to my own glory. That is a lot of trust for someone who by nature isn't very trusting. In order to rest in God's grace, we must lose ourselves to him. And my natural inclinations often get in the way of that. As someone who is highly introverted, I'd much rather spend the day curled up on the sofa with a pot of loose leaf tea and my favorite Tolkien novels than go out among people, especially people I don't know that well and interact and be useful. Then it usually becomes a tug of war because I feel guilty if I'm doing those activities and I have dishes waiting in the sink or a message on my phone that I'm not returning. As someone in the ministry field, those simple innocent pleasures can quickly become an enthralling burden. Christianity, brothers and sisters, isn't meant to be a cushy and luxurious experience. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be uncomfortable and painful as we grow more in the word and mature in Christ. Amen. 2 Peter 3.18 tells us that we are to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That means there's going to be some growing pains. If we are just floating along without immersing ourselves in God's word, if we're not giving time for prayer and devotion, then our burdens will continue to grow. When we become deaf and blind to the will of God and what he wants for us, rather than what we want him to do for us, we aren't going to find rest. When we take on the name of Christ, much is as much is it is expected of us. In John's Gospel at the Last Supper, Jesus said to his disciples, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You also should lo love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 
We are expected to be the example to those who may not have heard of Jesus Christ or are worn down and brokenhearted. As Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn and comfort with those who need that comfort. Amen. This is the yoke that Jesus carries. <clears throat> it is one of service, of sacrifice, of putting aside worldly things and distractions, and most importantly, it is a yoke of love. In his letter to the congregation in Ephesus, Paul explained that we don't serve others in order to be saved. We serve because we are saved. Amen. We are reaching the end of the season of Lent. Let us always see it as a time of renewal and rest from our burdens, rather than just a time of self-denial and gnashing our teeth in despair at the sins that remind us that we are very much human. We can't be perfect, but we can always improve. We are the most blessed of God's creation because we get to grow in knowledge and introspection, which leads to further maturity and understanding of what God wants for us and how we can display his infinite grace and mercy to those who may not have those gifts. Now, here's what I want you to do. Grab a backpack with your water bottle, Gatorade, kombucha, whatever it is you hydrate with, and come with me for a leisurely stroll. Sounds like fun, right? However, there are a couple of caveats to my invitation. This stroll is going to take us up to the beautiful snow-encrusted summit of Mount Hood. Oh my. Additionally, your backpack, instead of being full of food, tools, a first aid kit, windbreaker, and so on will be empty, but it won't be empty for long. This adventure is becoming less and less ap appealing with every syllable flying past my teeth, isn't it? Some of you may even be thinking that Anglican lady is a little crazy. <laughs> if you are, that's okay. There are plenty of fine people in Eugene who question my sanity on a regular basis, myself included. <laughs> So, as we progress along the gorgeous trail leading up the mountain, we notice that our packs are getting heavier. How can that be when they are empty at the trailhead? Perplexed, we each open our packs and find a variety of stones. Some are pebbles light as pumice, some are stones black as obsidian, and others are rocks heavy as boulders. These different weights are sins great and small. Some of them represent lies, instances of stealing, gluttony, adultery, any manner of burdens that cause us to stumble in our walk with the Almighty. As the trail gets steeper, our steps slow and become a shuffle instead of a stride. Our backs bend more and more under the weight of those rocks until we are completely hunched over. Then eventually we fall to our knees and cry out that we cannot take another step up this mountain. This is starting to sound like real life, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Things are definitely getting real in this house of God right now. This is what God is waiting for. Amen. When we get tired of running the race ourselves and admit that we need a course correction, that is what he's waiting for. Suddenly, we get a text message sent from the area code for heaven. Instead of there being a steep trail ahead, God tells us we're taking the ski chairs to the summit. Load and all. We finally get to the top. We're sore. We're exhausted. We're wondering what possessed us to take this crazy trip in the first place. As we begin to regain our senses, we notice in the distance ahead of us something tall. On closer inspection, we see that it is a giant wooden cross stained in blood with a sign that someone wrote on with a sentence translated in different languages and a crown of thorns dripping with blood thrown over the vertical beam. And who do you think is standing next to that cross? It's Jesus Christ himself. Amen. 
As we stare in shock, he gestures to the foot of the cross, where a large pile of stones that look just like the ones we've been carrying resides. Then he gently and lovingly smiles at us and says in a soft voice, Come to me with your packs and lay down the rocks that are your sins. Then take my pack. It is light as air and my bottles will never empty of drink. You carried such a heavy load up this mountain. But if you take rest in me, you will feel no burden and your feet will fly down the trail home. Let us pray. Father God, in this sacred time, please bless your people in this church and in the world who take on your name and shine with the light of your Son, who saved us from the burden of our sins. May we be quick to sit at the feet of Christ so we may learn from his holy example and take on the yoke he carries so that our lives are a testament to your perfect grace. In the name of the one who was, who is, and is to come, the Almighty. Amen.